Hey everyone, how's it going? I hope you're all doing great, as I always say, following the three H's of the channel and all that good stuff. In this video, it's the part two to the Wednesday video of the stories and encounters that are all about the American Southwest. And since this is a very vast area, there may be future videos on it, but for right now, it'll just be the two. And the area that I live in is going through some vast temperature changes currently, so if you can bear with me, there might be the sound of a fan or a heater in the background. The changes from day to day are about 35 degrees Celsius to 9 degrees Celsius, which in Fahrenheit I believe is about 95 or 96, all the way down to 45 or 44 degrees. So it's kind of a wild time of year, so I hope you can bear with me on that. Anyways, that's enough talking. I hope you enjoyed the video. Pull up a stump with me, and let's jump into it. Thank you for watching. So I have some family in rural Texas, and this happened when I went to visit them. They were showing me some cool kid spots around their town. You know, some abandoned businesses, an abandoned house that was said to be haunted, and all that crazy stuff. After we've had our fill of stories and cool kid spots like that, we're speeding back to their place, which is in the middle of nowhere. Still in Texas, though. And suddenly, we hit a patch of thick fog. The car just stops. We all jerk forward. The car wouldn't start. It's like the battery was dead or something. We had no radio. No, nothing. I'm sitting there with my cousins. We don't know what to do. This was before cell phones were a big thing, so we're just kind of by ourselves, kind of paranoid, kind of worried about what to do. Suddenly, we see headlights coming toward us we're all like I really hope they see us this is barely a two lane road and it's after midnight after 1am even the lights get closer they're coming fast and all of a sudden they pass us these lights go right by the car but we didn't hear anything we didn't hear a car. We didn't hear a truck. There was just nothing. We're really freaked out. We wait a few minutes. The fog just like disappears almost. Like it moved on to something else. We try starting the car again and it starts with no issue. We drive to their house wondering what happened. Who was the car? Why couldn't we hear it? Why did it only appear in the fog? We don't really know what happened that night. In 2019, me and a buddy decided to go camping up on the Mugion Rim. I've been camping or visiting up there for as long as I can remember. But we kind of wanted to go to our own spot, you know, just kind of be away from everybody. So we found some old forest roads and we went as far back as we could. Then we hit a fence that said if we crossed it that we would be on res territory. So we took this as our boundary line and we drove along the fence for a while and then turned down a trail and found a nice spot. And by nice I mean it was pretty okay. But it gave us kind of a weird vibe, if you get what I mean. We ignored it though, and we set up camp. The entire time we were there, it was ungodly silent. We arrived fairly early in the day, but never heard any birds, no bugs, no animals, anything. We eventually started a decent fire with the wood that I brought from home. But the entire time, nothing felt right, like, at all. 
Everything just kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies. There were no crickets or cicadas or anything. By 10 or 11 o'clock, I knew something was really off. We stuck it out until 1 a.m., but then decided that it was time to just leave. We started packing up quickly, but not really hastily. You know, just making sure we had everything. We're both using our flashlights to scan the trees because, for some reason, we're getting paranoid. But we weren't seeing anything until about 10 minutes into us packing up. My friend says, throw it all in the truck. We got to get the hell out of here. I didn't hesitate. I didn't look. I just did as he asked. I didn't ask questions until we got on the road for a bit. When we were driving, I asked him if he saw anything, if anything was different, because I felt off too. He said there was something that looked like a person. They were skinny, very pale, almost translucent. They had very messy hair, and they had long claws, not fingers, claws, and it was peeking around a tree. It made eye contact with him and smiled. We went to a family member's cabin for the rest of the night. Does anyone know what my friend might have seen? I think it may have been a you-know-what, a skinwalker, but I don't know. I'm not really going back there to find out if you can catch my drift. I live in the southern part of Texas on a ranch. Behind the main house of the ranch is a long rusted white gate that blocks the way to a large dense forest. On the ranch, we have a few animals, a few horses, some cows, goats, chickens, and two large dogs. During February of that year, the dogs would occasionally go crazy at night, barking nonstop. One night, I couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed my flashlight and went outside at about 1 a.m. to see what the hell the deal was. The dogs kept barking in the direction of the gate. I shone my flashlight over there, and there was light that reflected off an animal's eyes. I assumed in the moment that it was a wild fox or some other animal, and I threw a rock in its direction to try and scare it off. As the rock hit the metal gate, it startled the animal. The animal had to have been large because it hit the gate and made a loud, resonating ping. I thought I scared it off, and I went back to bed. The next night, the dogs were barking again. I thought I'd leave them alone and just ignore them until they stopped. I hear noises outside my window. It wasn't too unusual for one of the chickens to get out at night and rummage through my stuff outside. I put on my clothes and I grab my flashlight and I head outside to find that chicken. I follow the noise stealthily around the outside of the house. The chickens will start running away if they hear you. I show on the flashlight where I heard the noise. I see this large, dog-like, hairless creature. The snout is a bit longer. The tail is hairless small but visible fangs, and its back has ridges all along its spine, protruding out of its back. My dogs are going absolutely batshit now. It's glaring at me, and I still have the light on it. I just back up slowly, and then I book it inside. I don't sleep until dawn. From then on, I always carry a gun when I go outside at night. The dogs still bark here and there, but not nearly as much, but I'm sure it keeps coming back, looking for a way in. Utah and into eastern Idaho, the Morador, is filled with some crazy stuff. 
You just have to look. As for me, I don't really have a story of my own, admittedly, but this happened to my best friend's grandparents. See, they own a ton of land near Heber, which is east of SLC. It's basically a farm town. After the war, his grandpa came back from the Pacific and was a sheep herder and farmer. Over the years, he had a lot of strange things happen. When they would take the sheep onto public land to graze, sheep were born with two heads, missing back legs. One of them was born without a spine. It would commonly find dead sheep drained of all their blood, missing their eyes and their genitals. That really took off in the late 60s and still happened in the 90s before he retired. But the thing that scared his grandpa the most, and what I can only assume was a skinwalker, he would pull his trailer onto public land in the summer and every other week. He would switch off with his hired hand to keep an eye on the livestock. One night, he notices a pair of glowing eyes. They reminded him of a mountain lion, and it was slowly stalking up toward the sheep were huddled. Needless to say, the sheep were panicked, bleeding for help as loudly as they could. He grabbed the thirty out six and fired a warning shot. The thing kept coming. He fired again, this time aiming in between the eyes. The thing let out a twisted, almost human scream stood up on two legs, and took off. This went on for the rest of the week. He would take his gun out with him and sit in a chair next to the fire. The sheep huddled around him. Each time, he would shoot it, and it would take off. However, one time, it finally came in close, without him noticing. He said that it was because that he had built the fire too big, and the light pollution stopped him from seeing it stalking in. A snapping twig is what alerted him, ten feet to his left. In a panic, he fired while he reached behind him and grabbed a burning log and chucked it at the thing. He said it was the mangiest, sorriest animal he had ever seen, about six feet tall at the shoulder, covered in mangy hair. He said the closest thing he could compare it to was a skinny mangy bear standing up on its back legs. Its skin was bubbling from where the log hit it, and it was pissed. The sheep were in a panic, bleeding, and huddled next to the trailer. He fired another shot, this time aiming for the center of mass. He saw it stumble, and it took off, shambling in a weird sort of loping motion. He took off after it, pumping as many shots as he could. This thing was bleeding badly, so it was easy to track it by flashlight. About a mile from camp, he decided the thing wasn't worth it anymore. At this point, he could hear its painful cries filling the woods. He said it sounded oddly human. After this incident, he said he saw it one more time the following summer. He raised the rifle again, and this time, the thing just took off. It probably learned its lesson, and rightfully left this guy alone. I heard this story a few years ago, when I was barely 19. We were staying in his grandparents' house, since the area around Heber is great for elk hunting and we were going to scout around to see what was available for that coming season. He passed away later on that next year. And let me tell you, when a World War II vet who's 80-something years old and radiates the honor that he lived his life with tells you something while taking drags on a cigarette, shaking as he relates an incident that's over 40 years old that still scares him, kind of tend to believe him. A little bonus tidbit, the land that he owns and the public land that he was on 
was within a 20 mile radius of where Skinwalker Ranch is. This is something that happened way back when I just turned 18. I wanted to take a couple of my friends, Jesse and Perry, up the mountain and have a campfire. It was supposed to be, and usually is, a very good time, and it's also the only thing to do in central Utah. So we load up my pickup truck and we head up to the mountain. This is pretty far in the woods too. We enter through a clearing that's on the top of the mountain where all the locals set up their trailers. It's kind of at the edge of a large rocky cliff that's facing a large field with dense forest at its edges. One could safely scale down the cliff, but the broken rocks make it impossible to get back up. You would have to walk around the basin for miles just to get back to a road, let alone back to campsites. The locals were usually too lazy to go down there, even during the hunting season, because the deer always stayed away from it. It was just a pretty place to park your camper and have a good lookout. Usually the only type of people that used this field were shepherds. They would go down there to raise their flock in the field. After the first night of tailgating, I convinced the boys that we should go explore the woods at the bottom of the canyon. Perry and Jesse rarely see daylight due to their jobs, so it was a surprise that they said yes. We packed our bags with all of our junk food, and we shipped out in the morning of day two. I had the only weapon, or what could be considered a weapon, among us. It was a $7 Walmart hatchet. We headed down the cliff and started towards the forest across the field. We had no clue that this was the only way in, and the only way out. We started making our way across the field when we noticed a shepherd glaring at us from across his flock. As we made it to the edge of the forest, he shouted at us, Don't do anything that you will regret. And I thought, you know, you kind of sound like my grandpa. The woods were terribly thick though, and we continued it anyways. The whole way into the woods was a gradual descent among really dense pine trees. We knew that this was going to be awful to try and trek back up again. As we walked down the farther into the woods, we saw a coyote to our left on a rocky outcropping. He made no sound at all and didn't move, just watched us as we passed and then sprinted into the woods right after we walked by it. Coyotes are usually cowards, especially when they're alone. Perry, being afraid of coyotes, hurried us along past it. As we walked deeper, we saw another one watching us from an outcropping to the left. We were weirded out. We didn't think it was possible to be walking downhill in circles, but we were somehow, and we saw a coyote about every 10 minutes on the same outcropping. Perry had a really hard time trying to move forward, but by the fourth coyote, we knew that something was really off and that we had to move. After a 30 minute stretch of walking, we came across a large cliff wall with a small waterfall on top of it, but it had a massive dead tree on top obstructing the water flow. It was honestly pretty beautiful to see untouched nature like this. Jesse and I forgot about the spooky coyotes, but Perry was having none of it. We didn't believe him when he said that the top of the cliff was moving. Jesse was in the water when the tree dam burst and water came crashing down, pushing him under and soaking Perry and I. As the tree lifted higher, we saw that we weren't looking at a tree, but a massive antler. The huge elk raised its head and turned its gaze right toward us. It was at that moment that we heard the howling of an army of coyotes. Perry vomited. 
Perry, Jesse, and I have all lived in Utah long enough to know that elk are aggressive, but coyotes are not. Being in Utah, I thought the only thing we had to fear were skinwalkers, but apparently not. Jesse and I dragged Perry as fast as we could uphill in an attempt to know by the woods. The sound the elk made was unforgettable. It damn near ruined my ears. When we came across the rocky perch that the coyote would sit on, we instead now saw the shepherd from earlier, and he had a gun. He was screaming something about the mountain god, and he racked his gun. It was the most terrifying feeling ever. It was thanks to Perry's limp body and a large rock that Jesse found on the ground and the Walmart hatchet that we survived. Jesse was jacked, so he picked up Perry from the shore and tossed the rock at the shepherd. The old man never seemed to have to deal with intruders before, and he tried to shoot the rock instead of us. I was in panic mode. I ran up to him and whacked him with the hatchet. I made sure I hit him in the head. The weirdest part is, and the scariest part, there was no blood on my axe after he crumpled over. And not only that, there was no body. After he crumpled over, it's like he vanished. He was there one second and gone the next. The gun was still there. None of this made sense and it still doesn't now. We ended up making it out of the woods, but it was getting close to dark by this time. We didn't believe that we were gone this long, and we still were shaken by all the events that had happened. Perry collected himself once we broke out of the tree line, and we all dashed along the edge of the field to the road and made for my truck. Now, Perry is a Mormon, and he left on his mission. Jesse joined the army, and I did go there camping again, and I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find the outcropping. I couldn't find where we went into the woods. I couldn't find the waterfall. It was like nothing happened. We have no explanation for anything we experienced. So, what'd you think of those encounters? Let me know which one was your favorite one down in the comments. Do you have an encounter of your own? I have an email in the description below that you can send them to if you'd like to, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. In the description as well is a PayPal and a Patreon if you would like to donate to the channel that way, but no pressure there. And if you heard a noise in the background just there, it is my cat knocking my remote control off my TV stand because I'm not paying attention to her. And I'd like to thank everybody so much for 20,000 subscribers. It's a crazy feeling. I don't have words in the moment to describe how much I am floored at the fact that 20,000 people actually like the sound of my voice. But I think it's cool that we can all get together and all enjoy this type of content. It's pretty wild. It's been two and a half years and I plan to do it as long as I can. Or essentially as long as you feel like pulling up a stump and hearing the stories. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for liking the videos. Even if I don't always get to read your comments, they're still appreciated. So I guess you could say that our little family is growing. We have 20,000 stumps here now. At some point in the near future, I plan to do like a, a one hour video of some stuff I've already done, but that I really enjoyed or that got a lot of views. And yeah, but that's if you guys are okay with it. Because I know that everybody likes to have, you know, fresh stuff every week. And I'm fine with doing that too. I'm just kind of talking out loud here, I guess. But yeah, 
basically I'm very thankful for everyone. 20,000 of you, actually. Um, yeah, that's a weird number to think of. I can't really picture 20,000 people in my head. It's pretty wild, you know? But yeah. I will see you in the next one. I hope you all had a great week, a great weekend, and yeah, 20,000. That's crazy. Thank you for pulling up a stump. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Catch you later.